Hello, my name is Oliver Picard and welcome to beautiful Le Maison France. Welcome to my garden. Now, this is my lovely little Cox GTM and it has been the subject of my last two videos. And in last week's video I showed you everything that's wrong with it, which is many, many, many things. And after that video, I pulled it out of my garage and put it safely on my driveway so that I could then go out and buy self-leveling concrete to level my garage floor. Got all ready to do that and then my neighbour turns up and my neighbour's a really busy guy but he just happens to own a digger and as many of you know I'm also building my house at the same time as I'm building my car and so my neighbour says to me I'm free I've got my digger do you want to put your grey water filters in? I've got some big obelisk type grey water filters, eco filters, to, uh, to filter the water, the dirty water from my house. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I moved my car, I moved Jolene, my 2CV, and we got to work and we dug some flipping big ditches in order to carry all the dirty water from my house. Now, I was going to keep the GTM rolling for the time being. I was going to keep it rolling so that it was easier to move around and, uh, and move from place to place while I'm getting things sorted because I'm, I'm, I'm still in the planning phases yet, you know, designing suspension and, and sorting out, you know, my design for the chassis and all that. I'm waiting for a book from England from my grandmother because my, uh, my grandmother has a a big book that used to be my father's when my father was doing his engineering stuff and it's all on chassis and suspension design so I'm waiting for that but so I was gonna keep the GTM rolling for now but seeing as how I can't push it into my driveway into my driveway into my workshop I might as well strip it all back and put it on jack stands and then that way I can carry the chassis over the trench and into the workshop when I need it but all this bodywork can get out of the sun and be put away in storage because it all needs to stay nice and I don't really want it in a building site. So I'm going to put this up on the third floor of my workshop nice and safe. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to take the GTM apart into its constituent parts. So I'll remove the body, then I'm going to um, remove the subframes from the chassis and all that jazz. And I have to do that job two axle stands. So now the reason why I've got two axle stands is because I only own two axle stands and that's something that I need to remedy. But for now I'm going to use some big wooden blocks. These are specially designed and precision engineered wooden blocks that I have left over from doing the floor joists in my house. Um, they are pine and they are exceedingly strong. There's, in theory there's nothing wrong with holding a large amount of weight up using wooden blocks. I've been under 50 ton boats that have been held off the floor with wooden blocks in dry dock. And there's nothing, like I said, nothing in theory wrong with it. The, the accidents usually come with the application and people not knowing how to do it properly and stuff like that. So I would suggest only ever holding your car up with specially made axle stands. But if you do use wood, I am not responsible. And also if you do use wood, Never ever use concrete blocks instead of wood. Um, wood is better than concrete blocks, but nothing's better than axle stands. But for this situation, I'm not holding a car up. This is a rolling shell, and I'm only going to be holding my floor pan off the floor using wood. I'm not going to be using it to actually jack up a car while I work under the car. I will not be going under the vehicle at all. Um, I will just be holding it off the floor so that I can remove the subframes, which is very, very different than holding a car up or jacking a car up or any of that jazz. I once made a, a suspension adjustment video where I sat next to my car, well, I led next to my car while I took the weight off the suspension using a trolley jack, which is one of these. I prefer a trolley jack to uh, a bottle jack, but it's all pretty much the same stuff. A, bottle, a trolley jack's better because you can get it under a low car. But um, I once did a video about 2CV suspension adjustment where I led next to my car while taking the weight off the suspension. The wheels actually didn't leave the floor and people freaked out at me. I'm not going under the car. I'm only going to hold it off the floor with blocks of wood while I unbolt the floor, unbolt the floor pan from the subframes 
Anyway, let's get cracking, shall we? And I need a glamorous assistant. So, by the pad power of editing, ta-da, gone. Right, now then, the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take loads of photos and loads of measurements while it's all together. I need to measure the wheelbase on the undamaged side. I need to measure pretty much everything. The, the tracks are important because the track on this side is wrong. The track on that side is right, I think. But I'm not gonna be taking the subframes apart. So all my steering gear and stuff like that is all going to stay intact. But I need to take loads of reference photos and I need to take loads of measurements and write it all down. Because that way, when everything's apart, I still know where everything should be when I go to put it all back together again. So how to measure your wheelbase with a tape measure. Now you need a glamorous assistant, but what you do is you make sure that your tape measure is reading accurate or you use a steel rule and you place your tape measure along the center of your wheel like that and you measure this uh, diameter, whatever it is, measure across from here to here. And as you can see, that's 70 millimeters. And half of 70 millimeters is 35. So then you hold your tape measure at 35 millimeters, because this will be dead center from here to the edge of the wheel. You get your glamorous assistant to hold it there, and then you pull your tape measure back. And then that way, when you measure to the other side, you'll get an absolutely perfect wheelbase measurement. And if you, even if you uh, measure your stock car at home, you might actually find that your wheelbase is slightly different on one side to the other. This massively depends on who your car was made by and when it was made and the tolerances of the factory. There's a, a really famous story about Fox body Mustangs and uh, a, a magazine tested them and they, it's, it's a, a Mustang from the, what is it, early 90s and they measured a bunch of Fox body Mustangs and they found like an inch difference, which is 2.54 centimeters between like five different Mustangs. Um, so yeah, it all matters down to factory specifications and stuff like that, what, the, um, what that company's idea of precision was. And some cars are supposed to be wrong. Things like Renault 16s and Renault 4s have, and uh, Traction Advance as well, have a different wheelbase on one side to the other because of the torsion bars but most cars should have the same wheelbase on both sides and when i put this car back together it will do and that's why i need to measure the good side because the bad side has been crashed and so it's shorter right now we can pull the car straight and i can jack one side up this will show you just how crashed and twisted this car is the tires rubbing uh, not even full lock and the tires rubbing on the body this chassis is completely twisted but it's okay because I'm gonna make it right. The joys of a car that's so light. <laughs> right, I'm gonna chuck the back up now so that I can jack the front up. Because this car obviously doesn't have a handbrake, even if your car does have a handbrake, you should really put chocks behind the back wheels before you uh, jack the handbrake wheels up. On a 2CV, that's the front wheels. On an old Saab, some old Saabs, that's the front wheels. On most cars, that's the back wheels. But still, if you're jacking the wheels up, that are usually the handbrake, always chuck the car up. Even if you don't, because if your handbrake fails, the car could slide. So, chuck it up like that. And we need to find a good part, point to jack this car from. Um, can't be there, can't be there, it's gotta be there, I think. Now, as usual, I'm not going to leave it just on the jack, I'm gonna put an axle stand under each side. But always take your jack handle out, because if I'm walking round, I fall over the jack handle, the car falls over, it's not good. So under the floor pan here, there are some plates mounted and welded to the floor pan so that you can bolt a roll cage and to use as um, jacking points. The reason why I didn't use the factory jacking point is that's where I'm putting my axle stands. I've raised my car up, but I'm keeping my axle stands at the bottom, and that's because these tiny little wheels aren't very far off the floor. So now I'm going to lower the car down onto the axle stands, and then that means when I unbolt the subframe, I'll be able to roll it away from the floor pan. Simple. So 
what I'm going to do now is remove this subframe from this floor pan. Now, <laughs> there is a number of bolts. There's uh, two in the t each tower, and there are some underneath the floor, um, which they'll be fun getting to, especially in a white t-shirt. Of all the days to wear a white t-shirt, I could go and get changed, but uh, I'm not going to because it's hot. <laughs> so, first things first, I'm going to undo the ones from the floor. There should be two on each side, I think, and then do these ones. I can't see you because the sun's in the way and I haven't got sunglasses on. But uh, I'm wearing goggles while I'm in the car because it's full of... It's full of rusty shale and I don't want any in my eyes. The other thing is I've gone around with some anti-seize, anti-whatever, WD-40 type stuff. This is three in one. I'm not married to any particular brand. I like the Facom stuff because it smells like candy and it's made in France. Um, and I've got a mix of Imperial Spanners and Metric Spanners because it's a mini. And so they, they change their mind every five minutes. And you're always better using ring spanners and sockets where possible. Now, I've got two bolts down in the footwell. I think there should be four, but there's two. And I've got the top mounts there. But the first thing I'm going to do is take off the steering column and the steering wheel because it's in the way and it's annoying me. And I have somewhere an adjustable spanner. Where have I put it? Instantly, there we go. Instantly lost. It's only just past finger tight. There you go. Yeah, we go. And everything that I take apart, he says as he drops it. Everything that I take apart, I'm going to get the bolts back off and I'm going to put them through. Because it's okay getting everything in bags and putting tags on it and writing the name on and where it came from and blah blah blah. But if something has loads of bolts, it's easy to forget how it actually went together. And taking photos can help with that. But it's even better if you go to your shelf to get your part it has a tag on it of what it actually is and it has all the bolts in it as they go in it and that reminds you how to put it together often in restorations people spend you know i might not i might not use this but if i do reuse this then it could be six months till i have this in my hand again so it's really easy to forget what it is it's really easy to forget what bolts go with it and so that is really heavy for a tiny little steering column but uh, even so, I'm going to bolt it back together, put the bolts back in it, put the washers back in it as they went, and uh, then I'm going to put a paper label on it with a piece of masking tape before I put it into storage. And then that way, I remember where it goes, what it is, and I know how its bolts go together. If you're worried about, if you're worried about snapping bolts on a car like this, the way to do it is to tighten it, loosen it, tighten it, loosen it, tighten it, loosen it, and often, if, a, if you can turn a bolt like this, then tightening it just slightly and then backing it off might get it loose. Whereas if you just try and loosen it, try and loosen it, try and loosen it, it might just never come unstuck because the threads are rusty underneath the, yeah, underneath the nut. But the threads above it might be clean. So if you can tighten it just slightly, that might give you the leverage you then need to undo the entire thing. But uh, it's fighting me. And also, if, if you come up against a bolt that you can't undo, my advice is to spray some stuff on it, spray some, some WD-40 type stuff on it, leave it, and then go do the other ones, because just fighting one bolt constantly can be demoralizing. Um, so yeah. Right, I've sprayed it with some stuff, and I'm just gonna leave it for five minutes. It's amazing what leaving something for five minutes with some WD will do. A lot of people will spray it and then keep fighting it. And uh, it's a waste of time. Is that actually coming off? It's coming off. It's coming off. It's coming off. It's coming off. It's there. That's a gorilla song. If you didn't. Hey, the 
sometimes it's easy to get really demoralised, like fighting one bolt. And what you actually need to do is have a victory and then come back and fight another day on a bolt that's been soaked with WD-40. Yay! And this is why I'm wearing goggles because, I mean, it's just rusty and horrible and all that goes in your eyes and then you're blind. I mentioned before that minis are a mix of metric and imperial and I know I'm, I've got a lot of Americans who watch these videos and a lot of older English people as well who like a good imperial but I'm sorry, imperial's rubbish and uh, metric's better and so what I'm going to do is when I put this car back together I'm going to do a full metric conversion and that way I don't have to carry two sets of spanners in the car because as many as, as many of you know I do carry a toolkit in my car and so my toolkit will be lighter because it only needs half as many spanners righty tighty lefty loosey is one of those superb little adages that never leaves you it's superb and it's always true except for when it's not Yay. Boop. Boop. I'm, I'm, I'm steaming up can you see the moisture inside these goggles I'm actually steaming up that's how hot it is toasty and down she comes there we go One mini subframe. So I'm now going to put these pieces of wood under the car. And I'm going to line them up underneath the, uh, the central tunnel. There you go, that's better. Car goes up. Slide this under. So I dragged it up, put the three pieces underneath, and then dropped it back down. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the weight of the subframe with the trolley jack. Get back up there. It's easy to see how this car has just been put together kind of to be one piece to make it easy to roll around because the ball joints even on the rear if you come and have a look the ball joints on the rear are only one thread literally you could undo that with your fingers and of course the rear subframe bolts are uh, wing nuts so I'm going to take those off first now rather than busting one of my fingers open trying to get these wing nuts undone I'm actually going to put the adjustable just over the top of them and it can just help to get that first bit of leverage and after that you can do it with your fingers because there's no spanner that actually fits on a wing nut And the first one is out. Next one. Just slide it over the wing of the wing nut. I need, a, I need a socket on the other side. Thank you. 
some of you might question my decision to use an adjustable spanner on the, on the suspension tops, but I don't have the correct socket in my socket set because I think there are they're like a 32 or a 33 mil or some weird imperial. Most of them are finger tight anyway, and it's lunchtime in rural France. And so the chances of me being able to get the correct socket in today are very slim. Not only that, everything's shut. So I'd have to wait till two o'clock then to go to a shop only to find out they don't have it. So rather than that, because I'm going to put everything back in uh, metric anyway, I'm using a, an adjustable. My reason for wanting to do a metric conversion on this car is because I really want to use it. I want to go long distances in it. And if I ever have a problem, I want to be able to walk into a, a garage or walk into a, a bearing factors or something like that and just order the bolts I need or get them off a shelf, preferably. Um, you know, whereas if it's all Imperial and stuff, Imperial bolts are even hard to get in the UK nowadays. So having something that's really serviceable that I can go long distance with, that uses the minimum amount of spanners, it means I need to carry a minimum amount of tools and I can fix pretty much anything myself by the side of the road if I need to. You know, I'd really like to go to Morocco in this car and visit my family in Morocco. And, uh, breakdown services in Morocco don't exactly carry old mini bolts so doing a, a metric conversion and making everything as reliable and dependable and fixable as possible is a priority with this car because like I said I want to be able to take it anywhere in the world and uh, I thoroughly plan to. There we go. This is the point where I find out if I've taken all the bolts out or not but I think I have. Ta da! Yay! So now I've got the subframes off, my next job is to take these wheels off because I need to carry the subframes up two sets of stairs because my storage area is on my third floor. I didn't think that through, did I? So what I'm going to do is take all these wheels off and then, and of course, they're all different sizes. That's, it, that's a metric one and that's an imperial one. <laughs> Behind our lovely little 12 inch mini lights, we have these big wheel spacers and these gorgeous little mini thin drums. Now, wheel spacers aren't intrinsically bad things. A lot of people are very anti wheel spacer, but Porsche use tiny wheel spacers on the 911. They're not inherently bad, but these are the wrong sort to use because they're not hub centric. So they can move around like this and that's bad because what they should have is a little knurled edge on the inside that fits into the lip on the hub or on the drum in this case which stops them moving because when you go to put your wheel on you put your you put your uh, wheel spacer on first if i can get this right you put your wheel spacer on first but it can move around so it obviously it drops and then you put your wheel on and no matter how well your wheel is balanced the space is doing this as the hub revolves, which obviously isn't very good. So they're not going to be going back on the car. They, um, they were made to use wheel spaces to make the track wider, which will have helped the car to stop understeering. But it's not really the best way to do it. And it's also not really the best kind of wheel spacer. Behind those, we have these gorgeous little mini fin drums. You can actually see they actually say mini fin on them. So it's M I N I F I N, made in England. There you go. Now, mini fin drums are absolutely superb. They are 1920s technology, but on a mini, they work fantastically. What a mini fin drum is, is it's just like an ordinary drum brake, but it's made of aluminium. Behind this aluminium there is a, a, a steel belt that is the braking surface and then the alloy 
acts as the aluminium alloy acts as a radiator for the drum brake because what usually happens with the drum brake is it heats up and then it expands and gets bigger and so your brake feel disappears because your, your drum has actually expanded, gotten bigger and your brakes stop working. They also tend to boil very quickly because cast iron gets very hot and likes to hold on to its heat which is why we make stoves out of it. But there's a reason why we make radiators and also intercoolers out of aluminium and that's because aluminium doesn't like being hot. So these little mini fins shed their heat really well and really rapidly. And the fins on them, which gives them their name, helps them to do that because the fins increase the surface area of the drum brake and also catch the air, helping the drum, the drum to cool down, just like the fins that you see on an old air-cooled motorbike. There we go. I said in a previous video that I thought these were girling disc brakes off an early Mini Cooper S, but actually they're not. They're AP Racing. Uh, calipers which means they are a fantastic upgrade AP Racing are a British uh, uh, brake company that make pads, discs and calipers and uh, they're actually proper racing equipment which is superb, far better than the original Girlings. So there we have it, a Cox GTM floor pan stripped bare and if you're wondering just how light is it that's how light it is it's, it's one hand light Many people have said to me that I should put an electric drivetrain in this car, but I just can't bring myself to do it. She's too lightweight to fill full of batteries. I think it would be criminal. Uh, but yeah, the next, the, next, <laughs> the next job is to measure all of this up and then reproduce a chassis, just like this one, but that's not completely bent and crashed and twisted and set on fire. This chassis has been too modified and too damaged and too rusted to actually save. If there was any saving saving it, I would do. But at this point, it's much better just to start with fresh metal. Now, many people have also pointed out to me that I can buy a brand new floor pan for the, uh, for the Cox GTM. But unfortunately, the, that floor pan doesn't quite have all the improvements, even though they are improved. It's not quite improved enough for me because I'm six foot six and I need to fit in the car. And there's no point in me buying a brand new floor pan and then cutting it up. Shut up, Sparrow. Pretty noisy. Hey, that, that works. <laughs> um, there's no point in me buying a brand new floor pan just to cut up. I might as well start from scratch and, and make a floor pan. Uh, because like I say, there's a lot of little teeny tiny adjustments need making in order for me to sit in this comfortably because I really want to drive it a long way. I'm not just going to use it for track days. I'm not just going to use it for car shows and stuff like that. I really want to drive this thing. And uh, dependability and comfort long distance is prime in that. At Paramount is the word I was looking for. And with that, I'm about to go and carry two mini subframes up two sets of stairs, but you don't need to see that. So I will say thank you all for watching this video. If you're interested in my social media, that's all down in the description below. And if you'd like to support this YouTube channel, the best way that you can do that is by subscribing. The second way is by liking these videos. And the third way is by recommending these videos to your friends. Thank you all for watching. As I say, please be awesome to each other and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.